everyone, Steve from Backcountry Gallery here, and today I thought we'd review the new Nikon D500. However, before we begin, I'd like to thank my newsletter subscribers who helped shape this video. While putting this together, I asked them what they would like to see in this review, and I had a ton of great responses. So, a big thank you for all the help and ideas. Oh, and if you'd like to join that email newsletter, you can do so at my site. Just head on over there and sign right up. So, I've taken all the most common questions, as well as a healthy dose of what I like and the little bit that I don't like about the camera, and put all of that into this review. Oh, and I've also made a point of mentioning how I personally have the camera set up as we go along. I had a lot of requests for that. There's also a page for this review on my website that I'll be adding to as time goes on. Right now, it just details how I have the camera set up, but I'm sure I'm going to be adding to it. That link will be in the YouTube description for this video if you want to check it out. Also, note that this review is more of a practical field review from the perspective of a wildlife photographer than a number crunching technical review. Personally, I'm more interested in results than stats. And finally, this isn't just me grabbing a couple hundred shots and throwing a review together. I was lucky enough to have this camera on the first day it was available, and I immediately took it on a field trip to Florida for birds and to the Smoky Mountains for some bear. After 6,000 images, I'm ready to share my initial thoughts about how it performs in the real world. So, let's go ahead and get started. Controls and Layout I have to say, I really like the layout and control options with the D500. While it's different than any Nikon I've used before, it really didn't take long to feel right at home with everything. I especially like the new location for the ISO button, and the little joystick on the back is a welcome addition, and actually much better than the one on my D4. The new tilt screen is also an interesting feature, although I have yet to actually use it for photography. I think it's going to come in really handy though the next time I want to get eye level with a frog or when I'm doing macros in general. I'm also getting used to the touch screen, although the truth is at first I kept forgetting to use the touch features to review my images when I was out in the field. I guess I'm just too used to the old way. However, once I slowly got myself into the habit of using it for image review, I have to say I really liked it. A quick double tap and it zooms into the image at 100%, but of course you can pinch and zoom as well. And giving the photos a quick flick to scroll sure beats the heck out of using the buttons. It may seem gimmicky at first, but you know, give it a chance and I think it'll really grow on you. I know I was surprised. This camera is also loaded with customizable buttons, many of which are far more customizable than in the past. This has opened up lots of new ways to configure the camera for your individual style of shooting. For example, my two most used AF modes on this camera are Group AF and Single Point AF. However, I still use some of the other modes, so flipping through all of them when I quickly need a change is really a hassle. Well, not anymore. For example, because of these new customization options, I can now set my preview button to temporarily switch to a different AF mode when pressed. So let's say I'm doing action shots and I'm in group AF. I'm going along just fine, but maybe the action stops or the animal gets into heavy cover where I need single point AF. Instead of pressing the mode button and cycling through until I get to single point AF, I just press and hold my preview button and the camera is in single point AF mode until I release it. Once released, it goes back to the mode I was using before, in this example, group AF. Pretty sweet, huh? And that's only one of the choices for the preview button. There are a ton of choices at your fingertips, and the function button, AF on button, and sub selector also offer a similar amount of choices. I have to say, I'm also really enjoying the new viewfinder. Magnification is greater than the D7200, and while it's not as expansive as what you'd see when looking in a full frame camera, it's still very nice. The body itself is comfortable to work with, and it fits in my hands much better than the D7200 did. As far as size, the camera is between the D7200 and the D810 in size. For me, I think it's about the perfect size, large enough to comfortably hold, yet compact enough to take anywhere, although I admittedly like a larger camera body, so take that for what it's worth. I also purchased the grip for it, but it wasn't available yet when I was on my trip. Now that I have it, I certainly won't go back. I've always liked a grip on my camera. As expected, the grip works well, and I'm glad to have it. I hate doing verticals without it, actually. I also really like that the button layout is well matched to the camera. This certainly isn't the case with every camera and grip, but with the D500 going from horizontal to vertical is seamless as far as my fingers and their placement is concerned on the camera, and the feel is about the same with all the buttons too, so that's really nice. Autofocus. Okay, this is where I was the most impressed. The AF system in this camera has been just fantastic. My keep rate is through the roof and it tracks like a sniper. Also, I'm making these comparisons based on my experience with my D4, my D810, and my D7200. 
First off, initial acquisition seems to be greatly improved, especially with Group AF. In the past, I've been able to pin quite a few missed opportunities on the camera's inability to get an initial lock on a subject, and there's nothing more frustrating than seeing your AF point on your subject as the camera struggles to get a lock. Well, that's just not the case anymore. The D500 has an uncanny way of picking out my subjects, even against tricky backgrounds. Group AF seems particularly adept at this, but I think it's better across the board, at least compared to my other cameras. In the vast majority of cases, when I had my AF area on the subject, the camera instantly locked on and stayed locked on. Plus, the other side of this coin is that when I made a mistake on my end and lose tracking, I could correct and the camera would require focus almost instantly and very nearly every time. That just wasn't the case in the past with my other Nikons, at least not at this level. Not only is initial acquisition improved, but tracking is also. The truth is, the camera very seldom loses a lock. Most of the time, if an AF lock is lost, it's because I made a mistake. This tracking is simply tenacious. Once it gets a lock, it does not want to let go. As for AF modes, everything seems to work better than it did in previous cameras with similar modes. For birds in flight, I experimented with D25, group, 3D, and single AF. Overall, I found myself gravitating towards group AF for flight shots of small to medium-sized birds. It just seemed to have a higher keeper rate for me. D25 worked well too and would probably be a better choice in situations where you need a more precise AF location. I tried 3D and while it has been improved, it can still get fooled when my subjects and backgrounds are too similar in color. It's also more erratic, so you never know if it's going to focus on an eye, a body, a wing, or what. I have a feeling it probably works better with people than it does with wildlife. Single point continues to work well, however, I did notice that it seems slightly harder to use for flight shots than with my older cameras. This may be due to the smaller size of the AF points in the new camera, or I may have just been having an off day. It also didn't seem quite as quick to get the initial lock on as group AF was. That said, Actual focus speed on a stationary target was the same as far as I could tell with my basic tests. In any event, Group AF ended up being my go-to for most of my action work on this trip, and Single Point was my default for stationary subjects. As time goes on and I become more accustomed to the AF system, that may change. Another question that I've seen a lot is how does the camera do with low light AF? For this, I tested one of the toughest subjects I know black bears and low light. That situation has been a challenge and sometimes an impossibility for every Nikon AF system I've ever used. Well, it turns out that the D500 is actually better, but still not perfect. In really low light against the flat black fur of a bear, even the D500 can struggle. But hey, it's still better than any of my other cameras I've used, so you know what, I'll take it. That said, just as soon as there's the least little bit of contrast to get a bite on, the D500 comes right back into its own. As for non-black bear subjects in low light, it did better than I expected in every circumstance. The truth is, the camera can continue to lock onto subjects reliably well past the point I would stop shooting due to climbing ISOs, but a little bit more on that later. Also, I have to say, I absolutely love the fact that the AF points are spread out from one side of the screen to the other. I use my AF points for composition, moving them around to try to keep focus on the eye. This new layout makes it much easier to do so without the need to constantly focus and recompose. And the joystick on the back makes moving from point to point very intuitive. The new layout also has 153 AF points instead of the old setup with 51 AF points. Note that only 55 are user selectable, the rest are in between those points and used with the various tracking modes. In practice, this works great. It allows you to quickly move your AF area around and still be able to place your point where you like it in the composition. Speaking of which, the points are smaller, so the dynamic area AF numbers have changed. Instead of D9, D21, and D51, we now have D25, D72, and D153, respectively. The D25 and D72 areas cover approximately the same area in the viewfinder as the old D9 and D21 areas did, and of course the D153 option covers the entire autofocus area. Personally, if I'm using one of the dynamic modes, it's usually D25, sometimes D72. There's also been some changes to the focus tracking with lock-on options. We now have five settings from quick to delayed. I used to shut this off completely because the older cameras would occasionally lose focus and pick up on the background. When that happened, the delay would cause the camera to hesitate. When I tried to regain the focus, I'd often just miss the shot. Well, 
Tracking has improved so much that that's not as big of a problem as it was in the past. In fact, having the lock on engage allows me a split second to regain focus if I happen to wander off the target. Currently, I like mine set at two for the birds and flight shots I've been doing, but certainly test yours to see what works best for you. The other new part of the setting is subject motion. So far, I've kept mine between erratic and steady. However, I could totally see going for erratic for something that's not as predictable as the types of birds I've been photographing in flight. What about the new AF fine tuning feature? Well, I have to say, I don't like it nearly as much as some of the other new stuff. When I was in Florida, I met up with my friend Michael Tapes, the inventor of LensLine. We were talking about the new camera and, long story short, ended up going to his place and using the LensAlign system to dial in my 300PF lens on the D500. So let's just say I'm completely confident with the plus two adjustment we came up with. After all, it was done by the guy who invented LensAlign. Oh, and when I tested it in the field, sure enough, boatloads of tack sharp images. After I returned from my trip, I decided to see if the AF fine tune feature worked as well as LensAlign. The procedure is pretty simple. Put the camera into live view, Make sure the AF point is centered, and then focus the image. Once you have the image perfectly focused, hold in the AF mode button and the video record button at the same time. A screen will come up, just click OK. Now go to your AF fine tune menu and you'll see that a value has been entered for the lens. Pretty sweet, huh? Well, not so fast. I did this multiple times and the readings were all across the board. The range was from minus four to plus six and I've heard of people getting even wilder swings than that. So in the end, I'm just not sure how useful it is and in fact, I think it actually has potential to do more harm than good. Personally, I'm gonna stick with LensAlign. I've been using it for years and it's a much more controlled, precise way of testing and determining the optimum tuning value for a lens. And with a high pixel density sensor like this, your lenses really do need to be as spot on as possible. Auto fine tuning aside, in my opinion, if you want just one reason to upgrade to the D500, it would be the AF system. I'm absolutely thrilled with it. I think it's safe to say it's a really nice step up from the very best that Nikon had to offer just last year. Shutter, frames per second, and buffer. Now, another thing I really like about the D500 is the shutter. It's not super silent like the D810, but it's quieter than the D7200 and certainly quieter than the D4. I've actually scared animals off with the D4 before, and I don't think that's gonna be a problem with the D500, at least it hasn't been yet. Oh, and it also has a couple of quiet modes, but honestly, they don't seem that much softer to me, just slower. Uh, as for mere blackout, it's not terrible at full speed, but you know what? I'd always like to see it a bit less than it is. Speaking of speed, I love the 10 frames per second this body delivers. So many times people misunderstand why frames per second is so important. In short, it's not about spraying and praying. It's about getting more options from each burst. 10 frames per second gives you more perfect wing beats, more perfect glances, more perfect splashes. In short, more perfect moments, and I'm glad to have it. It's not that cameras with slower frames per second can't deliver incredible action shots. It's that the faster cameras deliver more of them. Which brings me to the buffer. I've had a lot of questions regarding the performance, both with XQD cards and SD cards, so I did some basic testing. With my SanDisk Extreme Pro card, I was able to get 45 images before the buffer began to chug. In all honesty, that should be enough for pretty much everybody using this camera, probably 95% of the people. I personally have yet to knock off 45 in a row in the field. Now, XQD cards are another story. With my Lexar 2933X card in there, I was able to pop off 200 shots, but that's not the whole story. The reason it stopped at 200 shots is the camera won't go beyond that. The 200 shot limit is presumably so you don't kill your camera if you leave it on and stick it in your bag and the shutter button gets depressed. However, there's something cool that no one else seems to mention. If you hit that 200 mark and then take your finger off for just a second or two, you can go right on shooting. Check this out. In this clip, I'm about to hit the buffer. There it is. I take my finger off for a second and there you go, I'm pounding away again frame after frame. Basically, with a fast XQD card, you have an unlimited buffer in the D500. Sensor performance. Next, let's look at sensor performance. First off, I'd like to say I'm really liking the files I'm seeing from this camera. They look a lot like what I get from my D810 in terms of color, and they seem almost as malleable in post. One thing I did notice that I want to pass on to Lightroom users, though. 
I personally have been liking the camera neutral setting better than the Adobe standard profile. Normally, I kind of go back and forth between them, but I just don't like Adobe's profile for this camera this time around. It seems to add too much contrast, seems to rob it of some color too, so take a look at that when you're in there. What about dynamic range? Well, Nikon did really good here. At ISO 100, it beats the D5 by over a stop and is less than a stop behind both the D810 and D750. At ISO 800 and above, it's less than half a stop from either the D750 or the D810 and starts trailing behind the D5, which knocks out everyone above ISO 2500. So, in short, dynamic range isn't an issue with this camera. In fact, here are a couple examples. This image was on my first evening with the camera and I had the exposure set wrong. Looking at the file on the back of the camera, I was absolutely sure I blew the highlights. However, turns out that even with the exposure this far off, the camera didn't actually clip the highlights in RAW, and I was able to recover the shots in Lightroom. Here's one with the opposite problem. As you can see, it's over two stops underexposed, but just a quick adjustment of the exposure slider in Lightroom, and it comes right back. The camera is actually ISO invariant, and other tests have shown that you can actually pull an image back that's up to five stops underexposed and end up with a noise level that's nearly identical to what it would have been had you set the ISO in the camera to the equivalent setting. In other words, let's say you're shooting manual mode at 1 2,000th of a second at f4, and the proper ISO for your light level is ISO 3200, but you accidentally had your camera set at ISO 100, a five stop difference. You shoot a few shots and you catch your error and readjust your ISO to 3200 for the rest of the shoot. When you get back to your computer, you can actually pull those underexposed shots up by five stops and end up with about the same noise level and quality as the properly exposed image. Pretty sweet. The benefit here is that if you're in a situation with this camera where blowing highlights is a concern, you can allow the camera to underexpose a bit and know that you can pull the file up to the proper exposure when you get back to your computer. Speaking of ISO, how good is it anyway? Well, let's put it this way. It's fantastic for a crop sensor, but it's still the performance of a crop sensor. Now, I know there are people on the internet saying that this camera is as good as or better than its full-frame counterparts, but that just isn't the case, at least not for RAW files. Figure this camera is about a stop behind the current crop of Nikon full-frame bodies. From my field experience, it seems like it might be just a touch better than the D7200, but if it is, I mean, we're only talking a third of a stop. In fact, when looking at images side by side with the D7200 file downsampled to D500 size, they really are neck and neck. Personally, I'll cap mine out at ISO 4000 unless there's something really special going on, but I don't tolerate noisy files very well. Most of my subjects have a lot of fur feathers and that detail gets obscured by too much noise. Now, I've seen images with less detailed subjects that looked really good at ISO 6400 from this camera, but beyond that, everything starts to look too noisy, at least to me. However, the D500 seems to be able to capture a ton of detail, and the noise pattern is very easy to work with. I use noise reduction software on most of my files, and the files take noise reduction really, really well if you have a sharp image. I love Topaz Denoise. It seems like it can clean up D500 files pretty easily while maintaining really good detail. By the way, along the lines of sensor performance, I want to mention white balance really quick. I know it's not a big concern for raw shooters, but the JPEG crowd will love to hear this. I think it's noticeably improved over Nikon's past offerings. In the past, I often found myself switching white balance, or at least noticing it wasn't right when I looked on the back of the camera. With this camera, it just seems to get it right most of the time, at least for the type of images I've been doing so far. Other concerns. I've seen and received messages from people asking about a few common concerns with this camera, so let's take a look at those. Batteries. It seems like most third-party batteries are not working in the D500. Now, all of my Nikon batteries have been just fine, even some of the older ones. Now, I also did hear from a few people having issues with older Nikon batteries, particularly the lithium-ion-01 units. I have a few of those, and I haven't had any problems yet. So, if you have an older Nikon battery, I'd say just be aware there may be an issue using it. There's also a lot of reports about battery drain. Now, I shot over 2,000 images on a very productive morning out on a boat in Florida, and I did it all with just a single battery. Most of the time, it seems like I was getting around 1,000 to 1,200 shots or so before I wanted to change batteries, so I must have chimped a lot less on the boat or something. I did, however, experience a strange drain on my battery when I wasn't using the camera, but it was left on. Since the camera is Wi-Fi enabled, I ended up putting it into airplane mode, and I haven't had the problem since, so I don't know, maybe that was all it was. Sharpness. 
Another concern I see is about sharpness. Now, based on the images I've captured, I don't think it's a problem at all. It's not an issue with my particular camera body anyway. I have a feeling that a lot of the sharpness problems stem from people trying to do action shots when they're not used to doing them with a DX camera. The tight pixel density will demand a much better technique and usually higher shutter speeds than what you may be used to if you're coming from a full frame camera. Keep in mind that this is like shooting a 48 megapixel full frame sensor, so it's going to demand a higher level of technical proficiency to get the most out of it. For birds in flight, I'm often trying to shoot between 1 3200th and 1 5000th of a second. You can get away with lower speed sometimes, but anything slower than 2000th of a second and you'll be really starting to fight motion blur. Of course, for more stationary subjects, slower shutter speeds are just fine. Personally, I'm completely happy with the level of sharpness I'm seeing from my particular camera, and my files seem to need very little in the way of post-processing sharpening. In fact, I've been turning sharpening down when I'm using my web sharpening actions, if that tells you anything. Recommendations. Finally, I want to pass along my recommendations. I had a ton of people asking me about the D500 versus, well, about every other Nikon ever made. Since it would take hours to go through all those comparisons, I'm going to leave you with some guidelines. First off, for DX shooters, if you're debating between this and maybe something like a D7200, it really comes down to performance. Sensor-wise, both cameras seem fairly evenly matched across the board, with the D7200 enjoying a slight advantage in resolution. So, if you're doing action of some sort, you need better low-light AF performance, need a deeper buffer, or if there's any other aspect of the D500 that you feel will help you get the type of shots you're after, then the D500 makes sense. On the other hand, if you're doing more static images, portraits, posed wildlife, landscapes, and really don't shoot much action, then the D7200 is probably a better choice. Oh, and I mean, don't get me wrong, the D7200 can also do action, I have plenty of shots to prove it, but it just doesn't get you the keeper rate on those type of shots that the D500 does. I mean, make no mistake, the D500 is an absolute major upgrade in this department. Of course, there's also the ergonomics of the camera. I like the layout, the feel, the customization options, and the size of the D500 far better than the D7200, but that's just my personal opinion. The D500 also has better weather sealing, which may be important to some shooters. And so it's not an easy decision, and in the end, I think you should let the types of photos you make help guide you to the camera that seems best suited for your needs. The other question is along the lines of, should I get the D500 or a full frame body? I'll tell you straight up, all things being equal, I will always pick the full frame option over the crop body. Full frame sensors are about a stop better in ISO performance, and I'd like to have that improvement whenever I can. Plus, there's usually slightly better dynamic range, color preservation at higher ISOs, etc. So all things being equal, I'll go full frame. The problem is, things aren't always equal, are they? First off, let's look at effective focal lengths. If I just don't have enough lens for a full frame body to get the crop I want, I'll switch to DX every time. I know you can still crop a full frame body, but I'm not getting nearly the number of pixels in that crop I can for my D500. Think of it this way. If I was shooting a D5 and had to crop my image to the DX area, my final image would be just over 9 megapixels versus the D500's nearly 21. Even against the DA10, it would be 16 versus 21, so the D500 is still putting more pixels on my ducks. Plus, there's the size factor. When I go hiking with my gear, my typical setup is now my D500 and 300PF with a 1.4 teleconverter in my pocket. In terms of full frame field of view, that's like having a 450mm f4 lens without a teleconverter and a 630mm lens with one attached. And it all fits in the palm of my hand and is totally hand holdable too. In order to get that kind of reach for my full frame gear, I need this setup and it's not nearly as much fun to hike with. And then there's performance. So many times people get caught up with the sensor itself, but the truth is if some limitation in your camera is preventing you from getting the shot, it really doesn't matter how great your sensor is, does it? The D500 is far superior to all but the pro-level bodies in every performance respect, at least at the time of this video. Better AF across the board, faster frame rate, deeper buffer, better layout and ergonomics for action, better control customization, and on and on. If I'm shooting action and have the choice between my DA10 and the D500, the D500 is going to win every time. It's simply going to help me capture images that the DA10 is going to miss. Heck, the frame rate alone gives me twice as many opportunities per burst to capture a magic moment. So in the end, you need to pick the right tool for the job. My kit now consists of a DA10, a D500, and a D5. For wildlife, I anticipate using the D5 and D500 equally and leveraging the advantage of each camera as the situation dictates.
Of course, there's more to getting great wildlife images than just the gear. You have to have the know-how as well. And that's where my ebook, Secrets to Studying Wildlife Photography, comes in. It's 290 pages that teach you all of my very best tips, tricks, and techniques for putting award-winning images on your memory cards. Check it out at my site and join the thousands of others who are already putting the advice to work each time they're out in the field shooting. Also, make sure you stop by my site and sign up for my free email newsletter so you never miss a video or an article. And of course, I'd love it if you'd subscribe to my YouTube channel. Thanks so much for watching and have a great day.